Welcome, everybody. It's the last session of the last day, and you're still holding on strong. So thank you for, thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, managing your free range devices. Uh, like chickens, anything like that? Free range chickens? No? OK, I'm, I'm running out of jokes. They were pretty bad at the beginning of the week. They're getting worse now. Um, so managing your free range devices. Um, we're going to be doing a, a pretty high level overview um, of some of the, the topics and concepts and, and processes uh, to be able to communicate and manage your devices off network. Um, this is, if you were at the a ghost in the cloud talk this morning, anybody go to that one? All right, we're not going to take the deep dive uh, that James did. Um, so just to, to give you fair warning on that one, um, we want to make sure that this topic is approachable. And that was our general goal. So um, just a little bit of forewarning there. All right, so my name is Dusty Dory, um, Manager of Education Services. Uh, I've been with Jamf Software for uh, three and a half, four years now. Uh, I teach several of the certification courses, um, well, all of them, um, and the Apple courses as well. So I've met some of you uh, in the certification courses. Uh, so thanks for still coming back despite that. Um, <laughs> and Rob? Yeah, uh, my name's Rob Potvin. I'm also Education Services Engineer. Um, I've been with Jamf for two months. Yeah. Um, and I'm, uh, yeah, based in, in the EMA region, so Europe, Middle East, Africa, so. Yeah, Rob was a customer for a number of years, so d don't worry about the two months as a jam thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right, so uh, also before we get going, I'm gonna apologize. Uh, I'm gonna apologize because I have an accent um, from the upper Midwest, so for those of you that uh, are not, you're gonna notice I'm gonna say my O's really funny, things like that. And Rob's even worse. Rob's Canadian, despite the fact that he lives in Europe. Um, so I'm going to say DMZ, and he's going to say DMZ, um, guaranteed. So just, Don't get just go with it. Uh, we're talking about the same thing. Um, all right, so let's get into it. Managing uh, your, your free range devices. Uh, what we're going to be doing here first is we want to establish, um, first and foremost, what, is, what exactly is the challenge that we're looking to overcome here. Uh, we're going to start with a very detailed uh, example and, and a very detailed challenge and use that as kind of our tool for, for building on these concepts uh, to make this topic approachable. <clears throat> After we've established what the challenge is, uh, we're going to take a look at those concepts in a little bit more depth. Uh, make sure that everybody's kind of on the same page uh, with some of the different topics we're going to talk about and some of the tools that we're going to use to get there. Uh, once we've established the challenge and the concepts, um, Rob. Yep, I'm going to take you guys through um, the process. Cool. And then we're going to leave some time for QA and uh, let you guys get out of here and get to the, the final happy hour. So. All right, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. Um, talking about the challenges. Uh, I think the, the idea and the challenge that devices go home, um, they go off of your network, is pretty well understood. So um, just a show of hands for those that are in the room, who here has devices that you are responsible for managing that are going to, at some point in time, leave your network? All right. How many of you would like to have some sort of management or inventory or some type of information or communication with these devices? Right, OK, that's why you're here. Um, so we want to be able to communicate with these devices off of our network, um, off of the LAN or while they're on the, the WAN. Um, so all right, primary challenge. When we do this, uh, we're going to be opening ourselves up to uh, security issues. Right? So if we're opening up our JSS, that's potentially a security problem because your JSS manages your devices. So we're going to be talking about some of the mechanisms and tools that we have to make sure we maintain <coughs> security of the JSS, despite the fact that we're going to be uh, making our JSS infrastructure available to the wider world. Uh, and then we're actually going to talk about the topic um, of delivering content. Again, we're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of going through an installer for different types of, of tool sets, um, but we are going to talk about the concepts and, and some of the things that you might use um, to address that. <coughs> All right, so getting into the concepts here. Uh, we're going to start off um, very, very basic, something that everybody here, if you have a JSS set up already, should be familiar with. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, a Mac Pro as my example for our JSS. Um, I just haven't let go of this model Mac Pro yet in my head. It's still my favorite one. So we're going to use that. We're not going to use that little Darth Vader looking cylinder thing. Um, all right, so we have a Mac Pro here. This Mac Pro in our example is going to serve as our JSS. It's going to be hosting MySQL. It's going to be hosting Tomcat. Um, that's our, our primary JSS. We have that up and running. Things are good. Our devices, uh, starting off, are going to be uh, communicating with that JSS. And what we're doing here with uh, kind of these zones, both are, are shown as green right now. We're going to consider green as being our internal network. 
right? So right now, um, in this image, we have our JSS and our client devices all being uh, on the same network, all on our internal network, communication's good. All right, that's not the problem. We all know how to do this. I suspect everybody in the room already has a JSS set up working this way. The problem occurs is when those devices go off network, right? They go somewhere else, they go home, they go to a coffee shop down the street, right? That's the, the real problem. Uh, and the reason that this is a problem is that you probably have some type of a firewall, right? So who has a firewall right now between your JSS and the outside world, right? Okay, cool. That's a kind of a problem, it's a good thing, right? It's protecting your internal network, um, but as far as this external communication goes, it's the, the potential pain point. Um, so we need to, to somehow uh, traverse this. Now, you could just punch a hole all the way through from the outside uh, to your JSS, but this is something that when you bring it up to most of your network administrators, um, or maybe you are the network administrator, it's going to get uh, some groans, a little bit of cringing, um, maybe just a flat out, not on my network kind of response. So the, the way that we're going to examine uh, getting around this or dealing with this sort of a situation is by introducing uh, a second server in uh, the DMZ. All right, so the yellow is going to be representing our DMZ here. So we're going to place a, a second server. In this case, we used a, a Mac Mini as our visual representation. This could be a virtual machine. It could be whatever you want, right? as long as it can host um, a, a JSS. This secondary machine, however, is not going to be hosting MySQL. All right, MySQL will stay on the JSS that's on your internal network. The secondary server, whether it's a Mac Mini or a VM, is just going to be hosting Tomcat and that portion of the JSS. So once we have that in place, what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to open communication um, very specifically. We're going to open communication uh, from the server that's sitting in the DMZ back to the server in our production um, environment on our internal network. So let's take a look at this a little bit further. Let's make sure everybody's on the same page here. So that DMZ or the DMZ when Rob talks about it. Um, the, the common term for this is demilitarized network, or demilitarized zone, sorry. Um, the, the DMZ really is a subnet that is externally facing. Um, you're gonna be able to provide public IPs in this range. Um, this is probably sitting in the same data center as all of your internal services. Um, really the only difference is gonna be um, whatever you're plugging into that particular switch is externally facing and can assign uh, IP addresses uh, accordingly, right? The, the beauty of the DMZ um, is that it is something that you still can control, and when you place your devices there, um, they're available to the external world, and we're going to be able to start offering those services. Um, and we can start doing some very detailed networking uh, as far as saying uh, we can open up from this host to that host um, and not open up to the wider world. Right? So what we're doing here by placing the secondary server in the DMZ, um, we're really just trying to work with our networking team. Right, we're trying to make sure that we're going to um, open some, some holes in our firewall, but that we're trying to do it uh, with a, as little impact as possible. All right, the next thing we're going to need to address or be aware of is uh, this concept of a split DNS. So who here has heard of a split DNS? A few people, a few people. All right, this is a little bit of an interesting concept. Um, so everybody here has typed in www.google.com, right? Yeah, we've all gone to Google. Um, does Google have one server? Probably not, right? They have entire farms. Um, so Google uses um, all kinds of, of DNS rules and trickery and all kinds of things to make sure that when you type in www.google.com that it just goes to whatever server makes sense and that you're able to use their service. Um, that's, a, a, I'm sure, an a extremely complicated process that they use to do this. Um, but we can do something very simple and very similar, right? We can actually utilize DNS and use these domain names that uh, we use to identify our computers uh, in the example, uh, jss.company.com. And I can actually say, if you are on the internal network and you connect to https colon slash slash jss.company.com, then you should go to my primary JSS. And I can also say, um, when a computer does a DNS lookup, and it's on an external network that when they go to jss.company.com, that they should go to that server that's sitting on uh, the, the, DNC, uh, the DMZ. That's gonna be called a split DNS. 
Very, very common for networking teams to, to set this up. Um, so if you're not controlling your DNS, um, you're probably, again, going to have to work with that network administrator. All right. One of the last concepts and things that we're going to need to take a look at here um, before we start digging into the JSS tools is the idea that we're going to be opening a port through our firewall. Uh, at the end of the day, we are still going to have to open some type of a port and hole through that firewall for this to work. Uh, but instead of exposing our entire JSS, what we're going to do is we're going to expose that secondary JSS. And then we're going to tell our firewall very specifically that the host in the DMZ can connect to the host internally. And we're going to do it over a specific port of 3306. So this is going to limit the ability for external um, hosts for Johnny No Good, who's sitting at home to try to hack into your production environment because he's likely not coming or shouldn't be coming from the host that is sitting uh, in your DMZ. Also, uh, what Rob's going to do is he's going to walk you through some of the prep work that we're going to do for the production JSS. On the production JSS, inside of the MySQL service, uh, there's actually going to be some specific security settings that we're going to apply to further secure this type of environment. <clears throat> All right, one of the last uh, things I want to talk about before I let Rob get into the process here is the topic of clustering. Clustering is a, a, a JSS uh, tool that we utilize um, and what clustering does for us is it essentially creates an awareness uh, that there's multiple web apps in the environment. So when we start off, we have a standard JSS, single instance of Tomcat, single instance of MySQL. The first time this spins up, or every time you reboot Tomcat, Tomcat communicates with MySQL and actually caches a set of information. And this is information that uh, the JSS uses on a routine basis, and it's also information that doesn't change frequently. So it creates a, a cache of certain bits of information that are within that MySQL database. The problem comes in when we bring in this secondary web application and we start allowing that secondary web application to also communicate with that MySQL database. When we're doing that, we're also allowing it the ability to commit changes to that database and potentially commit changes to the information that was in that cache. So when my secondary web application comes in and it does something like update my management framework, the production JSS, even though MySQL and Tomcat in this example are on the same exact box, uh, the production JSS uh, web application doesn't know that this change has been committed until that cache is refreshed. So one of the big things we do with clustering is we basically establish an awareness. Right? We used a green dotted line here. This is not a connection between the two of them. Um, we're just establishing awareness. Essentially, we're saying, hey, web application, <clears throat> that's sitting on the production JSS, there's a new kid in town. And this new kid in town is also going to be writing to this information. So we establish an awareness. And what it's going to do right away is it's going to shorten uh, the cache period. So uh, it's going to say by default that the cache is only good for 60 seconds. Right? So every 60 seconds, it's going to go and check against the MySQL database and say, hey, were there any changes? Do I need to update the cache? It's also going to allow us to define uh, a master. And the master is then going to take control of certain functions. So some of the functions that the master is going to be responsible for uh, would be flushing the database logs. It's going to be responsible for updating smart computer groups, smart mobile device groups, if they're based on a date time setting. Uh, so if anybody's ever done a smart group for computers that have not checked in for more than 14 days or something of that nature, the master is going to be calculating those types of groups. So it's very important that once we get this environment set up, we enable clustering so that these two different web apps both know about each other. Uh, one of the last things we're, we're going to bring up, um, we're not going to go through the installation process, uh, but we want to talk about external distribution points. If you're communicating with devices off network, you may very well want to deliver content to those devices when they're off network. One of the new tools in <coughs> version 9 of the Casper Suite is cloud distribution points. Uh, cloud distribution points are very, very exciting for us, particularly in relation to managing devices when they're off network. Uh, the three technologies that we're utilizing with cloud distribution points at this point in time are Amazon Web Services, Rackspace, and Akamai. One of the wonderful parts about using a cloud distribution point is that when I go ahead and upload a package to my Amazon Web Services uh, cloud distribution point, 
it goes up there locally to the Amazon Web Services server that's nearby me. But if I have devices um, that are communicating from my home base in Minneapolis, and maybe we have devices that are communicating from Hong Kong, uh, one of the cool things that happens with Amazon is it actually handles replication on its own. It looks like a single point of contact as far as ArcGIS is concerned, but Amazon's actually going to handle replication worldwide within a matter of seconds. So as soon as we finish uploading that package, within a matter of seconds, Amazon Web Services is actually going to start uh, replicating that out to their other endpoints. It's doing all of that work for us. Uh, same thing with like a, a Rackspace or Akamai solution. All right, some of you may be in environments where you can't allow your information to be hosted off of your network. Right? Uh, your organization might say, uh, due to data security or something of that nature, we can't use these type of solutions. In an environment like that, it would be possible to also use uh, a JDS. Um, for instance, we could place a JDS in the DMZ just as we're placing our secondary JSS web application. Uh, so it's just something we wanted to bring up that you could place these um, right next to each other. They could be sitting on VMs hosted on the same VM server. Right? Placing a JDS in the, in, uh, the DMZ uh, would allow you to deliver those packages, but keep in mind it's also going to utilize all of that bandwidth. Right? There are going to be increased um, upload <laughs> from, your, from your data center. All right, so just to recap what we're looking to do here. Uh, we already had a production JSS in our internal network. Everything was working, things were great. Um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to introduce um, a secondary web application. In this process, we could also look at installing a JDS uh, in the DMZ or potentially leveraging a cloud distribution point. All right, so now I'm gonna hand it off to Rob, and Rob's gonna take you through uh, the process for getting the secondary JSS set up. Thanks, Dusty. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm gonna take you through the process once I figure out how to use the remote. Um, so first things we gotta look at is the preparation. Um, we'll break it down for you. We have our firewall rules and MySQL prep. Now, our firewall rules would be uh, making sure 3306 is open between our primary JSS and the new secondary JSS that we built. Next off is our MySQL prep. Now, Dusty before was talking about how, um, how specific we can get. Well, we're specific here. Um, this, is, this is the actual MySQL command. And what we're saying here is that we're gonna grant all access to the specific database, Jam Software, and all its tables from a speci specific user at a very specific IP address. And even more so, we're gonna identify that with a very specific password. Now, we wanna make sure that we run this command on our production JSS, because again, we're only running one database, right? But we're telling our production JSS that, or MySQL, that externally, there's one address with one specific username that has access to this table, uh, database and tables. Next off, we have to look at setting up the split DNS. Now, the wait is there because we've all worked with DNS before. Now, on our private network, DNS replication pretty fast, depending on your TTL, but in general, pretty fast. It's that since we're dealing with one host name, jss.company.com, we have to make sure that we set the DNS externally up so that, you know, two hours, maybe two days, that it propagates through the root DNS. So I'm gonna go on to installing your GSS. Now, again, um, this is gonna be the installer on our uh, JSS that's um, in the on our DMZ. Um, we're only using one MySQL database, so we're this here is the server name. This is our internal, our primary JSS, right? And again, um, back to the firewall rules, we opened up 3306, and that MySQL command here is database user, database name, and password. We're still not done. To continue on from what Dusty was talking about, we have to enable the clustering. Now, what clustering is, is making that aware, making the JSS in our primary and in the one in our DMZ aware of each other. Now, clustering is easy. We go to the clustering in the system setup here. We check mark use clustering. Now, below it, you'll see current web application. That's just giving us the address where we're coming from. So again, after installing, 
that JSS in our DMZ, we have two web interfaces. So we need to know which one we're at. The sync frequency here, this is the different, this is the time between the sync between our two JSS, JSS um, applications. So it's set to 60 seconds here. Um, that's the default. I wouldn't recommend changing it. It's, it's the, from what we know, it's the best. Now, below that is cluster awareness. Now, it says not aware. Well, we're setting it up, so it's not aware yet. Once we set up our master, so we know which one is the master, which is going to be our primary one that has the MySQL database, we hit save, we restart, we restart Tomcat, we go back to this preference pane here, and we'll see it's going to be, oh, I'm aware now. Now, to go one more further is we now have two JSS web interfaces, but we really don't want a web interface in our DMZ, right? As Dusty said before, we have Johnny No Good, so we don't want him to try to access, you know, a full functional web, you know, application within our DMZ. Now, this is where limited access comes in. Now, what limited access lets you do is disable that web front end. Now, we're not going to be disabling the management aspect of our JSS. We're just going to disable that kind of web access, right? So here, the, our external, lo, externally located DMZ JSS, I'm saying, yeah, I do not want full access. I want computer and mobile device access. But our primary local host, I really want full access. If you set these both to you know, computer and mobile access, you'll never access <laughs> your JSS again. So we want to make sure that our primary will have full access, and the external one in our DMZ, we have computer and mobile device access. So if I went to my now external DMZ located uh, web app, it would come up web application disabled. Now I f flew a lot of words there and everything else, but I like to draw it out, so I did a nice chemo draw out here. So our Mac Pro primary, primary JSS here, I have an iPad or you know a MacBook Air. I want to access my JSS. If I hit my jss.company.com, I can log into my JSS, do my administration, right? If I go off network and I want to hit jss.company.com, well, they share the same DNS name, but I'm going to be hitting the one that's located in my DMZ. I've just disabled web access. So going there, I'm going to get that. If I want to access my primary JSS, the one that's located in my private NAN, NAN, uh, LAN, I will have to uh, VPN in and access the, um, my primary JSS there. Okay. So now what we have left here is just kind of a uh, kind of an overview of what we've set up. I'm just going to hand it off to Dusty. He's going to just go through really quick here. Um, um, so yeah, actually at this point in time, uh, what we've gone through is we had a production JSS internal network. Everything's good. Went ahead, added the secondary JSS into the DMC. Uh, made sure that we enabled clustering. Made sure that we enabled enabled limited access mode. Restarted Tomcat on both of the servers. Uh, the firewall rules were in place. The grant all command had been run. And what's going to happen at this point in time, you as an administrator, when you're off network, you're not going to be able to log in uh, to the administrative console. But your devices that are off network will be able to communicate, pass through, receive policies, receive configuration profiles, any of the day-to-day -day management tasks that you are looking to perform. Uh, again, as Rob said, if you as an administrator do need to log into the network, Maybe you're on vacation, sitting on a beach in Tahiti or something like that, and you just have to create a policy. You're going to have to VPN into your production network to be able to do that. Um, just hugely beneficial as far as making sure that um, people can't sit at home and try to get into your JSS because they know it's your, your administrative console. All right. So that was a pretty high level overview. Uh, again, we just kind of want to get people thinking about this a little bit more, uh, make it approachable, make it something that you're maybe looking to do in your environment. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we left uh, a decent amount of time uh, for, for Q&A. Um, are there any questions? Anybody? Yeah. With the web app disabled, with the web app disabled, can you still do OTA enrollment? 
With the web app disabled, can you still do OT enrollment? I actually don't know off the top of my head. I apologize. Um, Chris, do you know? OK, cool, cool. Um, I've got it actually set up in my box upstairs. We can go ahead and just look right after this. So if you want to come up or down, we're on the ninth floor. Just go down to the eighth floor. We'll take a look. I actually have it set up right in, waiting to uh, test. Good question. Um, how does the clustering pref pane in the JSS handle MySQL hosted off of the primary JSS? Totally fine. It actually, uh, the example exactly. we just tried to go with something very, very basic, right? Mm -hmm. Something that would be pretty familiar. Uh, but as far as uh, clustering and where the database is hosted, uh, it's a non-issue. Okay. It doesn't doesn't need that to be localhost. Um, it just showed that because that's where the connection had been connected. Um, just to confirm, on the 3306 uh, is bi-directional from the new JSS and the DMZ to the MySQL server in the back end? Yes. Does it also need a connection to the master JSS or uh, just the MySQL? The, the Tomcat instances don't communicate. So Tomcat okay. communicates to MySQL, they don't communicate to each other. So they'll just be uh, for that host to connect over 3306 um, to, to MySQL. So if you're using MySQL that's hosted on a different server, the Tomcat instances don't have to talk to each other. Okay. Uh, the one thing that I, I didn't throw up because it was getting down a rabbit hole, um, if you're looking to integrate with like directory services, um, and they're on what, uh, 389 by default, uh, if you have like an AD or something like that, you might have to open that up from Tomcat back. Okay. All right. Um, one other question, if I could. Uh, any experience with separate domains? And uh, we have an internal domain mm -hmm. and an external domain. Okay. So on the public space, I likely would have to yeah, figure um, out some kind of. Are you a university? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, see that a lot in universities for some reason. Um, the. Where are you hosting your, your MySQL database currently? It's in an internal. In the internal domain? Side, yeah. Um, so you shouldn't have problems as long as the networking can communicate across to the MySQL database. You can really put these web apps anywhere. Um, you could even have one hosted on Amazon or something. Are you talking more about split DNS? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I was sorry. going more down the lines of split DNS because you're, you're saying, using an example of jss.company.com. Sure. Well, we've got a .NET on the inside and a .com on the outside. and. You know, we've, we've, oh, okay. Sorry. We've got a Nordstrom.net and a Nordstrom.com. Uh, yes. You need to have one management framework URL. Uh, yep. So the JSS infrastructure can only handle or only use one. So all of your clients are going to look to that one URL. So you'll have right. to go with one of them. Figure out that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Either publish yeah, sorry, the .net or publish the .com. So. Questions? I was just going to say, we do that in our organization. We have uh, internal and external. And like they were saying, you have to have either the external domain name needs to have an internal entry, so you can see that, or the internal domain name needs to be routable externally. It was super easy to set up. Uh, one thing that I would say be careful of is we've had a problem. We we migrated clients. They used to be externally using the external domain. We wanted them to use the internal domain. And as we moved them over, the mobile device management profile didn't pick up that domain name change. Um, maybe this is too technical, but everything was still working. It's just we couldn't send them mobile device management commands, which is easy to fix from policies and stuff. But that was, that was one weird thing that we saw. But double domains works as long as one can exist in either environment, in both environments. Yeah, for your OS 10 client, for your OS 10 clients, you still had management as far as policies and things like that. But any of your MDM and Woolman components, you had to re-enroll the devices. Um, <coughs> I'm really looking into Route 53 on Amazon with the dynamic IP for DNS. Is in the situation they have with their dual domains, could that be used to bypass that? Maybe have a unique DNS name that they could call instead and, and based on their IP details? The, the client machines, your OS 10 clients and your iOS clients, are always going to look for whatever your management framework URL is. So however you resolve that, if you're using um, split DNS or round robin DNS, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not super familiar with exactly how Route 53 works, um, 
on the back end, uh, at the end of the day, you need to make sure that you can provide one uh, DNS name, one URL to your management framework uh, in your JSS, and that gets replicated down to the clients. Yeah, yeah sorry, I don't know enough about Route 53 to know exactly what it's doing. But. I was just, um, I might be wrong, but I was under the impression that it could detect the IP address range that was coming, that was called it. No, it doesn't work. Doesn't, don't, don't worry about it, it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just curious how you'd handle failover in the DMZ. Would you have just a clone that you'd throw up, or you were, we really wouldn't worry about load balancing in the DMZ, but just for kind of failover, what would you recommend? We actually have had clusters, uh, uh, customers do uh, load balancers in both the DMZ and internally, uh, and, and again, it's all just a matter of that split DNS. As long as you can resolve those host names, um, if you want to put a load balancer in front of 10 clusters that all live inside of the DMZ, that's totally fine. Uh, it really comes down to the clients just know this one URL. As long as they can hit that from wherever they're at, you're going to be good. If you want to put a load balancer in between it, um, completely acceptable. If you have multiple load balancers, um, should absolutely keep working as well. Yeah. Uh, for mobile devices like in the iOS, having the communication through the DMZ would be fine for like those small configuration profiles and things like that. But for laptops, if you're not using or utilizing like a Amazon, for example, mm -hmm. at this point, would it be okay just to suffice with having scopes for like, you know, whether you're on site or off site, so they only get like small changes, like whether you uh, change like a managed pref or things like that, and then more or less have it cached when they come back on site? Have you guys seen people approach it in that manner for now? There, there's a number of different ways of dealing with it. The, the really easy solution is just you make the packages available and deal with the bandwidth. The, the easy solution as far as setting up the policies, right? But then you have that increased bandwidth usage. The other thing you can do is exactly like you said, be mindful in the creation of your policies and limit policies with large packages to only happening on uh, your internal network. So one of the things that you can do in the JSS is set up your network segments. And if you've defined your network segments for your environment, um, then you can say limit to these network segments and just include all of them. Um, and then if it's outside of those network segments, it's not gonna be in the scope of the policy to even run. Um, so even if you're talking about things like self-service items, when self-service loads, if it's not in scope, it won't even show it, right? It just won't even be available to them. Mm -hmm. um, that would probably be the other way of doing it. Um, in, in my old production environment, um, when we talked about doing this, that was all we had at that point in time. And it was just, all right, limited. It's only going to happen when they're on network. Um, and we were just looking to have the communication. Really, we just wanted the IP addresses. So, um, but that absolutely would be a, another way of just saying, I don't want to even deal with the packages off network. Um, but you could also um, cache the packages ahead of time. Uh, if you were in the previous talk, they were talking about doing that with the OS X installer. If you cache the package down ahead of time, um, you could leave that scope available and say install from cache because the package is already there as well. Um, about those network segments, um, in the cloud one, they were talking about the IP address of the internal of the, of, and the external. Nine lists both as the one that's listed and the one that they resolved back to the net, net translation. Um, when you're defining that network segment, are you saying the, uh, the only the internal one? Uh, or will it get confused if you happen to be going th uh, through the DMZ to um, the outside uh, JSS? It would it still think it's... it's uh, <laughs> The, the originating IP information, the X forwarded for information that's in the header, yeah. is going to be what should be hitting your, your server in the DMC. So it should see that originating IP address okay. and be able to evaluate, is this on my uh, network segment or not? Um, you always test, right? Because you can have different networking hardware in place that can mess with that X forwarded for information. Um, we've seen that a few times. Um, but X forwarded for is, is really what we're looking at for Tomcat there, um, that, that standard IP header information. Okay. And as long as you don't have any networking tools in place that are Mechanism. obscuring that, um, it should be fine. And that's very, very standard. Very, very standard. So. Yeah. Not sure exactly how to phrase this, um, but outdated client versions out in the DMZ. I was just trying to think if, if there's any difference of, of the JSS resolving that. It, is there, if there's a problem connecting the JSS internally, sometimes a client, they can still get the update, you know, from like 862 to 871 or whatever. But from, you know, out in the DMZ, is it, is it 
is it just going to behave the same, or is there going to be more difficulty? The the Jamf binary version and the management framework that yeah. that that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if it's um, outdated. It's, it should, as long as it can communicate with the web application, yeah. um, it should be able to pull down uh, the the Jamf binary, um, unpack that, and update the management framework. Um, if there's any problems with that, we have to really it's a support case and start looking at what exactly is interfering. Um, but there are typically not any issues. I'd be interested to know what the, uh, to look into what the original issue was on the internal network. Um, so that's not super common, not super common. So. Lindsay, you got a question? Again, you don't need a new setup to set this up. You could do, if you already have an in-production JSS and want to secure it more, it's, do you have another one? There is a if there's an outdated client and it's it's trying to connect and and is it is there going to be any registry that says I, I tried I'm outdated but I am checking in from this IP address um, check-ins and inventory are separate so as long as it can register that check-in information you should still be getting that and you should be getting the binary version as well with that um, yeah. So even if it doesn't submit a full inventory because that's failing for whatever reason, you should still get that check-in registration. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, I have an X server full uh, NIC card ports on it. Um, if I dedicated one of those NIC ports to DMZ, would you recommend that? <laughs> Um, that would basically be taking your production JSS and, and making that publicly available. Oh, you firewall block the other ports. You firewall block everything but you, what you need on that port. And in essence, could it be done? I mean, is, that's really bad, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, sure. Security sure. wise. Yeah. You, you could do that. Um, you're not going to benefit from being able to turn something into limited access mode because you just have one web application. Okay. Uh, so you're just taking your entire JSS, making it publicly available. Now that's not really any different than hosting your JSS in the cloud. Uh, but going through this method, you're just going to have that benefit of saying, all right, internal, I can have full access as an administrator. External, I can still have the management com commands be passed. I can still check in for policies and things like that. But you can't sit there and try to log in as an administrator. It's kind of an added security benefit. Cool. Uh, if that's it, I'll uh, let, let everybody get going. Thank you for joining us for the last session of the yeah. last day. <laughs>